Is it not true that doctors do get paid for every procedure or surgery that they make? Is that not an incentive for doctors to actually push surgeries on you, which you might not always need? Welcome to another video. I'm Dr. Leo and today we're going to be diving into a subject which is ripe with emotion because we do live in the world of cancel culture and social media shaming and hating and all this infighting and arguing, which does not always seem to be the most productive way to communicate. And this is an area where there's a lot of exactly that, right? There's a lot of blind trust in the medical field and there's a lot of blind distrust in the medical field as well. And I always feel when there's extreme stances like that, the truth is going to be somewhere in the middle. Are there places where we are falling short of our duty to take care of the public, to take care of the patients? That's what it comes to in the end, the lives. And when we're downgrading the value of lives by upgrading the value of profits for corporations and pharmaceutical companies, I think that is a big ethical blunder, which most doctors would not be happy to be making, consciously at least. But as it turns out, perhaps unconsciously, most of us are. But anyways, before we get started, I just want to give a quick heads up. This is okay to disagree on. I have many opinions which some of you may not agree with. And in the world of science, actually, being mistaken, being wrong is a good thing. This is how we learn. This is how a field progresses. So I always want to invite people to share their opinions. Let me know if you disagree with any of the things that I have to say here. And let us help each other to make sense of this crazy, chaotic, confusing, confounding, baffling world that we live in. Okay, so first things first, a lot of the audience watching my videos and myself and a lot of my friends and my family are well aware of this whole dynamic in the food industry, right? There's a lot of big companies who are marketing a lot of things, yet many of the same people who tend to be so skeptical towards marketing from the food industry in terms of telling us what is good for us, what we should be eating, sometimes seem to have this blind trust, right? This just believe in anything that a doctor or an organization or a company or a government body is going to be telling you about your health and we just blindly trust that and take that as a fact. And just like when we we're looking at the food industry, checking out where is the money coming from, where are there potential conflicts of interest, where is there potential corruption happening, Let's do the same and ask that question for the medical industry. Let's look at medical schools. This is where we are forming doctors at their most impressionable. When they are still students, they're still learning, they still have all these directions that they might potentially fall into. And some of you may be shocked to know that a lot of medical schools are receiving huge amounts of money from pharmaceutical companies. Between 1995 and 2004, Apotex gave University of Toronto $2,875,077 for research projects. GlaxoSmithKline put $4,566,930 towards research at the university from 1994 to 2020. This money included fellowships for three individual researchers, two of whom run labs. From 2014 to 2019, Janssen donated $1,642,998 for research. Allergen gave $272,696 between 2000 and 2003. Bristol Myers Squibb Pharmaceutical gave an infectious disease physician $180,000 between 2000 and 2005, and another doctor a two-year fellowship of $119,930 in 2001. So as you can see here, not only are these pharmaceutical companies paying huge chunks, huge sums of money to these universities in order to fund different research projects, but they're also paying directly to some of the highly respected physicians, some of the advisors, some of the professors who work in these universities. Do you think that's going to have an impact? on how we shape our future doctors. Now you might think that meddling with the education system, meddling with the teaching of future physicians where it should be as independent, should be as unbiased as possible is bad enough already. Check this out because it's not just medical schools and it's not just Canada. 16 health related all party parliamentary groups received 168 payments from 35 drug firms worth 1.2 million pounds in 2012 to 2018 one sixth of their total funding. Two all party parliamentary groups on health and cancer accepted more than 600,000 pounds in that time. 50 health focused all party parliamentary groups received almost another 1 million pounds and 304 payments from patient organizations or health charities, which themselves take sums of money from big pharma. Okay, so pharmaceutical companies are pouring money into medical schools and some of the policy making organizations. What about organizations that are there 
to control the pharmaceutical industry itself. There should be some checks and balances, there should be some quality control to make sure that things are happening in a proper way, that things are being researched correctly, and that we, the people who are being exposed to all of these chemicals, are safe. Well, let's jump over the ocean again and look at the US situation, where the Food and Drug Administration has moved from an entirely taxpayer funded entity to one increasingly funded by fees paid by manufacturers that are being regulated. Today, close to 45% of its budget comes from these user fees that companies pay when they apply for approval of a medical device or drug. Changes in more recent years have also increased the number of standard new drug applications approved the first time around by the FDA from 38% in 2005 to 61% in 2018. In diseases where there are not many medication options for patients, the FDA has a priority review process where 89% of new drug applications were approved the first time around and the approvals were were completed in eight months in 2018. All this occurred while the number of new drug applications have been increasing over time. Most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic has seen the FDA provide emergency use authorization for potential treatments in a matter of weeks, not months. While the number and speed of drug approvals have been increasing over time, so have the number of drugs that end up having serious safety issues coming to light after FDA approval. Before the User Fee Act was approved, 21% of medications were removed or had new black box warnings as compared to 27% afterwards. Again, I'm not telling you what you should believe and what you should be skeptical towards, but in order to have productive conversations, to have open discourse with people, it is important that we do understand these different points of views and see that there is actually good reasons for people believing in the different things that they do believe in. If we have the very organizations that are there to control the pharmaceutical industry, making money off of that industry itself, and we're seeing these trends from the moment we allowed this money to come from the companies from the industry we're seeing more drugs being approved more quickly and then more drugs having serious adverse events and more drugs having to be taken out of the market it's only natural that people aren't so geared up they're not so happy they're not so excited or elated to just jump on anything new to try new technology to try new medications to try new vaccines it makes sense that people are skeptical. But it's not just application fees to get the drugs approved. What about the actual people who work in the FDA? What about the committees that are there to make sure that everything is done properly and actually are making the decisions of what goes through and what doesn't? Of the more than 24 million in personal payments or research support from industry to the top 16 earning advisors who received more than $300,000 each, 93% came from the makers of drugs those advisors previously reviewed or from competitors. Most of these top earners and many others received other funds from those same companies concurrent with or in the year before their advisory service. Those payments were disclosed in scholarly journals but not by the FDA. Here you see a little visual representation of how much money some of these advisors in the committees are getting straight from the pharmaceutical industry. There are 20 that are making between 100,000 and a million dollars and six that are making over 1 million. Hmm, I need to approve or disprove of this drug. Well, it doesn't have as many tests, it doesn't have a huge amount of studies, so I guess we don't know. Maybe it's dangerous, but we can always pull it back out of the market, and uh, I am getting paid millions of dollars to uh, sit here and, um, you know, I'll just go, let's, let's just give it an approval. Let's just see how this goes. Now to go full circle, what about the doctors? Now I'm not here to criticize doctors. Some of my best friends are doctors. I'm a doctor. I've lived with, studied with, worked with, just spent a lot of time with doctors. I know there's amazing doctors. There's so many good human beings who are genuinely in the field to help people to save lives, to be a good person. But is the system set in place? Is it conducive to doctors being their best and doing what is best for the people, for the patients. While changing employment trends have shifted more surgeons towards hospital salaried positions in recent years, the compensation of most surgeons remains tightly associated with the number and types of procedures they provide. So that is it, now we have it come full circle. We have the medical schools where a lot of companies are having big influence and where the future doctors are at their most impressionable. A lot of their mindsets, a lot of their beliefs, a lot of what they're comfortable doing in their work life is going to be determined around these years. You also have some of the policymaking organizations getting big amounts of money 
from these pharmaceutical industries, even the control, the quality insurance, right? The, the quality control that's supposed to be there to make sure everything goes the way it's supposed to go, such as the FDA, not only directly getting paid by these companies, but some of the top advisors, some of the most respected people within these organizations are getting sums of over a million dollars each. And last but not least, the doctors themselves are often being paid directly for the amount of procedures, the, the volume of surgeries that they are doing. So again, is this a system that is conducive to allowing the doctors to do the best for patients? Now, I'm not accusing doctors of putting people unnecessarily through things just to make as much money as possible, but you have to think about it. Is a system that gets a doctor paid more for more medications they prescribe or more surgeries that they perform, is that going to motivate and stimulate doctors to do what is best for the patients at all costs? Or is that going to stimulate and perhaps push the line towards, oh, let's just do it, you know, we're getting paid a lot of money. It probably is going to help them. I don't know if it's going to help, but it might. And we're getting you know, paid a lot of money. Like, do you think that's going to have any impact on how medicine is practiced? And to finish off this video, let me share with you two times the medical industry has failed my family. My father, he was having some trouble with his knees. He was starting to hear some clicking. He wasn't being able to run as much as he used to without the pain. Went to an orthopedic surgeon, they straight away recommended, let's remove part of your meniscus, let's fix you up, you're gonna be much better, no problem. Luckily, he listened to his uh, wise son who had enough experience in the industry to see that most surgeries, especially around joints, never make the joint as good as new. It's not never like you, your artificial joint is going to recover the functionality of a natural biological joint. Instead, you might recover 60-70% functionality, nowhere near the same as what you would have naturally. So instead, he focused on weight training, focused on strengthening the muscles, the tendons around the joint to take some of that load off of the joint itself. And now he enjoys life as normal. He runs without pain. He does a lot of workouts. He goes skiing, no problem. And again, had he blindly listened to the doctor, it would have been a much worse condition. Second example. Myself, when I was a teenager, I was diagnosed with something called ITP, which, well, back in the days stood for idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura, because we didn't know what caused it. Now it's called still ITP, but now it stands for immune thrombocytopenia purpura, which is basically an autoimmune condition where your immune cells start attacking your own body, in this case, the blood platelets, which are an important part of the coagulation system. So it's an important part of what stops the bleeding whenever you cut yourself, whenever you bruise yourself, internal bleeding, whatever it is, the platelets make a plug to stop the vessel from bleeding. Now, when I was a teenager, I had this, my numbers were so low, I think it was at 19,000 at one point, the reference range is usually around 150,000 to 500,000, which means that any hit to my head, I could start bleeding internally, wouldn't stop, it could be life-threatening. So I had to stop sports. I went on a cortisone cure in order to dampen my immune system, platelets went back up, we stopped, platelets went back down, and straight away the doctor said, okay, that's it, let's remove your spleen. Luckily for me, my mom is a little bit skeptical. She doesn't blindly trust doctors, even though the doctor was very reassuring, saying the spleen is not that important. You can live totally fine without it. It's no big deal. But actually, my mom was smarter than that. She looked into it. The spleen has a lot of different functions in the body, especially in the immune system. It's very important. You have to go on antibiotics for the rest of your life if you remove your spleen. So she decided, you know what? We're not going to do that. We're going to try another cure of cortisone. Luckily, the autoimmune condition passed. Now I have totally normal numbers of platelets and I don't have to be on antibiotics for the rest of my life. So if you want to take from the anecdotal stories I just told you, or if you want to look at the numbers, the facts, the statistics, where is the money coming from, do allow that to kind of shape your reality of the medical industry. It is not something that I would recommend to do to just blindly trust in all of these experts always get second or even third opinions if you are trying to make a very big decision for your health. Trust the natural competence of the human body, which is far, far more advanced than any medical technologies that we have today. Prevention is better than cure. Get your health on point. And most of all, be empathetic, be compassionate towards other human beings, whether it's vaccines that you disagree on, whether it's surgeries or medications, whether chiropractic doctors or medical doctors or naturopaths or homeopaths or acupuncturists or whatever it is. Allow people to believe whatever they wanna believe. 
be okay with disagreeing and being of different opinions is a great thing in the end of the day. We need this heterogeneity, we need this variation in order to help each other fill each other's blind spots in order to arrive as close as possible to the truth. And like I said, I invite you to disagree with me. I invite you to share your opinions down below. I read a lot of your comments. Either here or here, there's gonna be a Patreon link or either here or here, there's going to be another video that you can check out. Put your comments down below. Let me hear your thoughts. And like always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.